So I mentioned uh, this morning that we had uh, uh, six partners uh, uh, with us today, uh, that there are partner breakouts. Uh, one of our, uh, and that some of those were partners in progress, uh, one of them uh, is Meta, where we've just started the process, uh, but it seemed like such a good opportunity uh, to put in front of you what, what Meta does, especially now that it's, it's part of a, a much larger uh, initiative, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, that uh, took advantage of Greg being here on vacation uh, to, uh, to come and see us and describe uh, what kind of thing we're trying to put together in, in partnership uh, to offer you. Greg? Fantastic. Thank you, um, John. And thanks, everyone, for, uh, for being here. This is a, a really great opportunity. Um, and I'm happy to speak to you um, probably for 10 or 15 minutes or so about Meta and then to answer uh, specific questions that you may have. Um, I have worked with Meta uh, since 2013. Uh, managing strategic partnerships, particularly as pertains to the uh, publishing industry. Um, I am a recovering publisher myself, uh, so I know this space well. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about uh, who Meta is, what we do, um, how we are uh, now part of the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and how we uh, are working with both individual publishers and hopefully with the, the Highwire uh, family moving forward. There are a series of ambitious goals that I'm going to uh, enumerate over the, the, the course of this, uh, this discussion. Uh, Meta was founded by uh, a cancer uh, genomicist uh, in Toronto uh, in, in 2011. Um, and he observed uh, as a researcher that um, there is a particular challenge that I'm sure um, you're all aware of either directly or indirectly. Uh, and that is that there is a, um, uh, I think the, um, Fair way to say it, there's a ton of information uh, that is being published uh, on a daily basis. There are 4,000 papers. I'm sure I'll have a slide up here shortly that says this. There are 4,000 papers uh, that are published every day. Um, and as a researcher, that's a challenge. Um, so I think you probably all know that, that your end users cobble together uh, strategies for, for staying abreast of what's happening in their fields. Um, they have saved searches, they have uh, PubMed searches, they have table of contents, RSS alerts, all sorts of these different processes that, that, that get Frankenstein together. Um, but those are inefficient, um, and they're inefficient in two ways. One is uh, they let a lot of stuff in that is not relevant uh, to the individual uh, researcher, so a lot of stuff that's really just noise for them. They also don't catch everything that is relevant, so you're left with a situation where there are too many false positives and too many false negatives uh, associated with, with research results. Uh, and Meta is uh, predicated on the notion that uh, some of the technical advances that we've seen in other fields uh, over the last uh, five or ten years can, can be applied uh, to uh, scholarly research and can uh, create better efficiencies. Um, so the, the, the fundamental premise is what if we could machine read every paper that has ever been published um, understand what those papers are about, how they connect to each other, and how they connect to the interests of individual researchers. Uh, wouldn't that be great if we could do that? Um, and that's what Meta has devoted uh, the past five or six years to, to doing. Um, we built a team, um, about 30 people, now it's actually about 40 people, um, based largely in Toronto, um, primarily uh, data scientists and, and AI experts. Um, and as, as John alluded to, um, we had a, a very interesting uh, event um, a, a few months ago uh, where the, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which is uh, Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook and his wife, uh, Dr. Priscilla Chan, um, they have an initiative uh, with the very ambitious goal. This is an ambitious goal. Their goal is an order of magnitude more ambitious, which is to uh, cure, treat, or manage uh, all diseases by the end of the century. Um, and they acquired Meta um, in uh, January of this year and moved us to an exclusively non-commercial model. And I'll explain what that means in, in just a minute. Um, but the reason uh, they brought Meta into the fold um, is because there's a fundamental belief within CZI uh, that we can make fundamental advances in the scientific realm by providing better basic tools to the research community. Uh, one of those tools, they believe, um, is uh, better discovery. If people had a better sense of what was going on and what was directly relevant to their own work in the labs, on the bench, that that would create an accelerating impact. 
I mentioned lots of papers. You all know this. This is all data that, that, that folks in this room know very, very well. Um, what we have done um, is we have built a knowledge graph. Um, so we have relationships with um, 80 or 100 different publishers, some of whom are in this room. Um, and we have, it's, it's an indexing relationship. Um, and we take uh, the full text of your articles. We don't serve it in any way. We don't share it. There's no posting of the files. But we machine read those files. Uh, and from them, we extract lots and lots of information to create uh, a better index, if you will. Um, we normalize 20 million different concepts. And across those 20 million different concepts, um, we have about 5 billion connections within this knowledge graph. So this relates to this, which relates to this, which relates to that. Um, humans are very, very good at this. Um, this is not meant to replace the work that uh, human uh, researchers or reviewers or editors do. This is meant to supplement that. Um, it's foolish not to use the technology at our disposal um, to, to create uh, better tools that make our lives more efficient. Um, so again, we have these relationships with, uh, with the publishers. Um, we've, we've built this knowledge graph, um, and that allows us to do uh, some interesting things. Um, fundamentally, the knowledge graph drives uh, everything that we do, but there are three specific elements that I want to talk about uh, here today. The first is uh, MetaScience, which is the end user um, discovery engine uh, that um, we have 100,000 or so users uh, and growing fairly dramatically uh, that are uh, signed up and using uh, on a regular basis to stay abreast of, of developments in their fields of interest. Completely free, um, somewhat um, um, uh, ironically, uh, when we were acquired by Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, um, which is designed to unlock all this and make it more available, more open, more free, the first thing that we do we did was put up a not a, not a paywall, but we put up a a, a temporary meter um, to to uh, restrict access to new members. So we're building, rebuilding uh, some of the infrastructure to scale. Um, to, to handle both the amount of content and also the, the amount of users uh, that are uh, projected uh, to benefit from this. And so if you go to the meta.science meta site right now, you can sign up to basically pre-register. Um, there are folks that are using it today. They're, they're grandfathered in. Um, we'll release that gate uh, within a matter of weeks, um, and then it'll be free for anyone to sign up and use. So. Again, uh, I, I talked about how this works. The idea is uh, if we can machine read uh, all of these papers, uh, we can have a better understanding of what is most relevant to individ individual users and their interests. Folks sign up, they fill out, it's basically a questionnaire, and they talk about the things that matter to them. Um, and we then create almost like a Twitter feed that appears on their, uh, their user page. It gets updated in real time, so if you publish a paper today, we index it tomorrow. It appears immediately on, on, on the user's feed. Um, and they're able to explore. They're able to look at related concepts. They're able to look at uh, authors who have, have written on this subject, journals that publish a lot of content uh, in, in these areas. Um, and ultimately, they're able to click on a link that's going to take them to your site for fulfillment. Um, so as I said, we have access to the full text. We use that for indexing purposes only. Uh, we don't have any sort of uh, file sharing. This is not uh, ResearchGate. It's not SciHub. It's not any of those things. Uh, the, the ultimate uh, final act uh, of a user who's interested in learning more is to click on a link that takes them to your page for fulfillment. Again, this is a, you know, just showing a, 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 a sample paper and all the different things that we can extract, affiliation, authors, co-authors, concepts. Um, and, and obviously, um, we're not just pulling from the metadata, we're pulling from that entire uh, paper and breaking it apart and seeing how frequently things are mentioned and how close, uh, closely terms are mentioned uh, in relation to each other and so forth. <coughs> so we have, we've created these, these pages, we're particularly strong in, in areas of biomedicine. So if you think about a series of concentric circles, Biomedicine was our primary initial area of focus. That's expanded out to the larger life sciences, the physical sciences, broader STM, including uh, engineering, computer science, and so forth, the social sciences, humanities. Um, so we are uh, ingesting as much content from as many sources uh, across as many subjects as we possibly can. Um, 
if you're interested in uh, cancer research, um, you're probably going to find meta more useful than if you're uh, into medieval studies. Um, just moving forward, um, again, really this is a, is a discovery service. So we think about um, the way folks get access to content. Um, and obviously, there are always going to be folks who have research questions who go to Google or Google Scholar or other services and type in a question and get a list of results. And you can do that on Meta as well. Our typical user behavior is really um, folks set up uh, these feeds for the things that interest them. They come back. They see how the feeds are being populated. Um, so that, that's more of the behavior that we see here. And the interaction is fantastic. Uh, we're finding that the average user session is about 15 minutes, um, which is an incredibly rich interaction uh, for, for folks. We obviously just had an analytics section, uh, session. Uh, that's an incredibly um, um, uh, deep engagement that we're finding for our users. So one of the things that's exciting, um, there are a lot of things that are exciting about the, the Chan Zuckerberg acquisition. Um, they have an oatmeal bar every other Thursday. I mean, that's exciting, right? <laughs> um, but probably more germane uh, to, to this conversation is some of the tools um, that as a small yeah. Canadian startup um, uh, we were licensing um, to partners are now um, available uh, on a non, or will be made available on a non-commercial basis. Uh, to the community. Um, and I want to talk specifically in some detail about something called bibliometric intelligence next. So uh, bibliometric intelligence is a tool. Um, it's a real tool. It's not hypothetical. It's been tested on uh, between two and three million real scholarly articles. Um, and it's used uh, by editors um, to uh, provide some insights into submitted manuscripts. Um, so the way that this works is a manuscript uh, gets submitted to a journal, um, a copy of the paper gets routed uh, to Meta. We don't add it to the knowledge graph. We don't uh, put it on any sort of public-facing server. We run it through uh, an analytics engine that we have, um, and within a 24-hour period, we generate a report um, that gets redeposited back in the editorial workflow um, and tells the editors uh, some, some interesting things. Um, so it provides an analysis of the likely impact of the paper. So impact is measured by three, projected three-year eigenfactor, uh, projected citation count uh, over a three-year period, and also where that sits relative to the rest of the scholarly, scholarly literature. So is this uh, in the top 5% of impact? Is it the, in the, the top 50% of impact? Um, it also provides um, a journal matching score. So based on our understanding of what this journal has published historically, um, how good a fit is this uh, for, for the journal? Um, it also provides uh, suggested reviewers as well. So based on analysis of the literature, um, based on not just this paper and the papers it cites, but based on the papers that those papers cite and how similar this paper is to the corpus of published literature who potential reviewers uh, 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 might be. Um, this is obviously uh, different. Um, there's no doubt about it. Um, this is not, um, I, I mentioned before, that we're not uh, trying to replace uh, humans in the, in the scholarly process. This is a, a prime example of that. Um, we can do some interesting analysis. We can draw some uh, interesting projections based on these papers. Um, editors uh, are the ultimate um, uh, arbiters, right? They have their expertise, um, and they bring that expertise to bear in the management of the journals, as well they should. This provides them with some additional data, some additional insights to do their jobs. Um, it is, again, not meant to replace anything uh, that they're already doing. It's meant to complement uh, what they're doing. The best use case that I can, I can cite for this is uh, imagine that there is a manuscript get, that gets submitted among the, whatever, 200 or 300 or 500 manuscripts that your journal gets on a weekly or a monthly basis. And imagine there's a, a, a manuscript that is potentially a superstar manuscript, one that really is going to have a lot of, of impact. And I don't just mean impact in terms of the, the data, the metrics that I'm talking about. I mean impact in terms of making a difference. Um, it would be nice uh, to publish that paper. Um, it would be nice uh, to have that paper as part of your, your corpus. Um, I would not in any way suggest that uh, that paper uh, get accepted automatically based on a report, uh, a bibliometric intelligence report. 
but it might be useful to fast track it for, uh, for evaluation, to send it out for peer review and to make sure that it gets through the system uh, in, in an expedited fashion. Uh, that's the type of use case that we're finding um, uh, editors are, are using this technology for. Again, accelerating the, the, the research life cycle is what, what I talked about. Um, there's a component of this um, that we, uh, so, sorry, uh, just to square the circle on that. Um, this is a tool that has been a commercial tool. It will be a non-commercial tool. What that means is um, we will have a public API for any of our indexing partners that want to use this technology, they'll be able to use it. Um, and we will integrate with um, specific systems. Um, Benchpress is one of the, the systems we're, we're discussing integration and what that would look like, but also Editorial Manager and Scholar One and tools like that. Um, and we hope the community uses uh, this tool and we hope that, that they find benefit from it. Um, there's a flavor of this um, that we will provide, as opposed to via an API, uh, we will also provide via a secure login um, a similar type of report for newly published papers. So obviously once a paper is accepted by a specific journal, the journal that accepts it changes the calculation a little bit. Now it's not just uh, a, a, an abstract uh, monograph, uh, 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 sorry, a hypothetical manuscript that could be published someplace, but it's an actual journal article appearing in an actual journal. Um, and so we uh, will have a dashboard uh, for our publisher partners, they'll be able to log into, and they'll be able to see some predictions on the first uh, six months of that paper's life, what we think the trajectory is gonna look like in terms of impact. Um, and that's important, obviously, because papers take a while to accrue citations. So this gives you, hopefully, some um, uh, predictive insights in, into where that paper is gonna go. Um, the last thing I want to talk about, and then I'll pause for questions, is, is something called horizon scanning. One of the things that I think Meta does well is we look at data. We look at data about published papers, and we're able to make some interesting predictions. Obviously, we just talked about it at the manuscript level, which is a very, very granular level. But we can also do that at a higher level as well. Um, and that's what horizon scanning is about. So horizon scanning is a predictive intelligence agent uh, uh, engine that basically looks at um, what is going to be talked about at the high wire meeting, at the AAAS meeting, um, at, at various meetings in 2019, 2020, 2021. Um, we're trying to be able to um, discern before the human eye can um, what these emerging topics are. Um, and so what we've done is we've taken um, a technology that was developed by uh, SRI just, uh, just up the road um, in conjunction with the US government, with the uh, IARPA group, um, they spent a, a five-year program, there was about $30 million invested in this technology to, again, try to understand um, this notion of emergence, to try and create a, a technical way to define emergence within science. Um, we scan the scientific literature as well as a variety of other, we call them somewhat anachronistically, we call them exotic content sources, but things like uh, patent data um, and also fo uh, uh, foreign data sources as well to create, again, the notion is sort of this crystal ball for science and technology. Um, one of the things that's a challenge for us in this new sort of, uh, not sort of, this new non-commercial space um, is we had created a very, very robust, very, very rich, very, very, um, frankly, dense uh, product um, that we were licensing to life sciences and, and big farm and, and organizations like that. Um, we're in the process of putting together an interface which is um, a little bit more consumer friendly. So you can see here, this is what horizon scanning looks like today. There are all these sliders and there are various, various concepts and there's an emergence score and there's a prominence. Um, the feedback that we've had is it's a bit too much information. Um, and so we're in the process, as I said, of, of, of streamlining that um, and figuring out how to make it available to the community. And going forward, that's really our idea is uh, we have this knowledge graph. Um, we want to be able to tell stories about trends in research. Um, and we want to be able to provide tools that make that information actionable. Um, and we're really pleased to be uh, in conversation uh, with Highwire about how to be able to unfold and unspool these tools to you as a community. Um, and in the interim, uh, obviously we have relationships with maybe a half a dozen or so uh, Highwire publishers directly, um, and we're happy to continue those conversations as well. 
Um, so I'll pause uh, for questions. My contact information is there, and of course, anyone who wants to, to learn more about this directly um, can email me at any point. I'd be happy to talk. But let me let me open it up for questions and see what uh, what folks are interested in. Questions for Greg. Susan, oh, go ahead. We'll just repeat the question. Yes. Absolutely. So, so the idea behind the API, right? Would you is, uh, repeat the question? Sure. So the question is, uh, if if uh, using an editorial management system not among those that I listed, uh, what happens then? Um, and we're happy to to integrate with any system. Um, uh, the notion behind an API, obviously, is you can uh, plug it in, right? And so we'll provide uh, some general direction to plug it in. But we'll also work with you if you have specific questions about, okay, how do we, what does the integration path look like? Our team can help set that up. Can I ask one question? Absolutely. That's part of it. That's part, the question. So the question is within horizon scanning, is there is there grant information that's embedded in with that? And that is part of that exotic content set is is, is grants grants information. Drawn from a couple different databases. Um, primarily US, but not exclusively. Yep. Uh, Anurag, you have a mic? Oh no, you, go ahead. Go ahead. And then hand it to Chris. Um, so I was really intrigued by both the bibliometric intelligence and the horizon scanning. You had mentioned that bibliometric intelligence had been in use for a while by uh, many editors. I was wondering if there were some examples of diamonds in the rough that were uncovered by bibliometric intelligence that were otherwise not seen by the editors. Because the most common thing that you would use is who wrote it. That's the most, by far, the highest, strongest predictor of whether this paper is likely to be successful. The, the challenge, of course, is to find ones that you don't have that history. I'd be really intrigued if there were examples yeah, that. I, I'd be, and, and in fact, anyone who's interested, uh, again, if you if you email me, I'd be happy <laughs> to send you a white paper that actually digs into that. It is obviously uh, uh, who, who the authors are, uh, where they're affiliated with. These are there's a high correlation, but it's it's certainly not. That's what's interesting, right? Of course, is is. Um, we all, as editors, have these shorthands that we use, right? So this gets to the top of the pile because the person's from Harvard or because I know them or they're in this lab or that lab. And obviously, there is some correlation there. Um, but it also becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, and so we want to try and break through that a little bit. Yep. Uh, my question sort of all related also with respect to bibliometric intelligence. What are you doing to test the outputs of the tool in, in real life, if you will. Yep, yeah, so uh, the, the start of it was actually we uh, uh, rewound the knowledge graph to 2011. So we looked at uh, papers that were published in specific months. So we looked at, I think, October 2011 and January 2012. So these are um, before they had accrued anything. We then stripped away where they were published. So whether it was a science uh, paper or a PLOS One paper, we stripped that away so the system, in effect, didn't know it. And we offered predictions, again, on, uh, well, we did it in 1.1 million in the first tranche, 1.1 million papers. And then we compared that to, in 2014, what had actually happened, so what had actually occurred. We then recalibrated and ran it on another million papers, uh, and, and again, uh, compared to the actual results. Um, they're predictions, right? So they're not perfect. Um, at scale, uh, they're, they're pretty darn good, though, is the answer. And again, I, I'm, I'm happy to provide uh, more documentation because it's a very, very interesting question. Also, if anyone's really interested, we can get the, the, the data geeks on the phone and they would be uh, happy to spend probably more time than you would want on that question. Was there a precision recall number? Of the, of the predictions, we made 10 predictions and five were cracks. I, I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you, sir. So normally, in any such prediction, you have a pre uh, precision recall number. I made 10 predictions. Five were right, yes. five were not so right. So I have a 50% precision, I have a uh, yes. maybe uh, whatever percent recall. I was wondering if from the white paper that you mentioned if you might be able to share a precision recall number. Uh, the paper might, I don't off the top of my head have it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Other questions? In the, uh, where? Yep. As you guys retool meta.com, are there gonna be APIs 
and or widgets for that for, for embeddability back to We hope so. I mean, the idea, like I said, is, is, is not only to uh, provide these insights, but to make them actionable, right? And th that idea of actionable is uh, both for the individual researcher, but also for the community. Um, and, and the specific, specifics of that, I don't want to, um, I don't want to tap dance around, but it's, it's a little bit of an open question in the sense that um, this has all gone down relatively recently. And so figuring out sort of how the, the sequencing of how things are rolled out um, is, is sort of where we're at now. But the goal is, yes, to be as open as possible, um, while at the same time respecting that we're not going to give away the content of, uh, of those, you know, those publishers that are contributing to the knowledge graph. Last question. If I'm an author, will I be able to use the tools, upload my manuscript, get a sense of how popular my manuscript is, Th and this then, is a, then yeah. shop it around to people like so, us? So this is a great question, right? Um, so, so imagine, right, imagine a world in which an author could uh, uh, submit the manuscript uh, to this system and be told, you know, you have a 4% chance of being accepted in nature, a 6% chance of being accepted in, right, you know, that, that type of thing. Um, or, or even just, you know, the appropriateness for the journal, uh, for the manuscript of certain journals. Um, I think the answer is in the long run, there will be um, an individual end user version of this that has some of that functionality. Um, just getting back to the, the tap dancing notion, we want to do that in a way that doesn't open the door to unintended consequences so that there's gaming and, I mean, in a sense, there's, there's, there, there are efficiencies that could be recognized, right? Um, if, it, if it unclogged the system from some submissions that never had a chance of being accepted, um, we just, again, need to, to do that in a thoughtful way. One of the things we're doing is we're trying to engage directly with our publishing partners on questions like this to say, well, if we did this, what might the downside be? Um, and what might the, the reaction be among uh, our publishing partners? Uh, we don't pretend that we know all the answers. Thank you very much, guys. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.